Hello and welcome to this second episode in our London Review of Books close reading series on satire. I'm Claire Bucknell and I'm a fellow of All Souls Oxford and a contributor to the paper. And I'm joined again by Colin Burrow. Hello. Also a fellow of All Souls and also a contributor. And today, Colin, we are going to talk about one of your favourite things ever, the satires of John Donne. Take it away. Absolutely, absolutely. What a pleasure. Um, He wrote five first satires. And that was probably in the period 1593-ish to seven. Uh, So he was really young. He's in his early 20s. And we're going to talk about these and about other satires written by clever young men in the late 1590s, some of which are even ruder than Dunn's. Okay, sounds like we might need some trigger warnings up top. Very definitely. Um, People who enjoy sodomy, bestiality, vomiting, dildos, syphilis and classical influences will without doubt take pleasure in this podcast. Um, If you're of a squeamish disposition, you might maybe wait for the episode on Jane Austen where, where, you know, unnatural acts with goats are a bit less likely to occur, perhaps. We're not promising that. We are promising that this one will, will include such terrible acts. Okay, uh, that should cover us. So uh, start us off, who was John Donne? Well, people think of him as that man in the big hat who wrote Jacobean lyric poems. Uh, And his chief literary influence came from his wonderful and densely argued and self-contradictory love lyrics like The Flea and The Sun Rising, which, you know, everybody more or less will have read who is interested in poems. And they generated a whole dynasty of imitators right through the 17th century, and a style of poetry that came to be called metaphysical, which just means it argues a lot, really. And Dunn's poems generate bubbles of passion and arguments, and then they typically burst their own bubbles whilst continuing to live in the bubble of argument at the same time. And we see some of those features coming through in the satires, I think. Um, He came from a family that was Catholic on his mother's side, although not actually on his father's, and his brother Henry died in jail for having given shelter to a Catholic priest. And eventually Dunn took holy orders in the English church and became dean of St Paul's Cathedral, no less, where he preached sermons in front of King James the Sixth and First. So it is a rich and varied career. And anyone, in fact, who wants to know more about his life and work should buy our friend and colleague Kate Rundle's wonderful book, Super Infinite, which if you've read it, you'll love it. And if you haven't read it, you will read it and love it. Um, End of plug. Absolutely. And buy, not borrow. Definitely. So the the satires, which Kate does talk about, actually, but they do give us an Elizabethan done. And if it is correct that his first satire dates from 1593, and that's a date that's given on one of the manuscripts, so, you know, it probably is right, then he was the first Elizabethan author to attempt formal verse satire in the vein of Roman satires by Horace and Juvenal and Perseus. So that's a pretty striking literary historical event. Uh, and they're also important events, I think, in his own career as a poet, and they give that sort of Elizabethan underbelly to the Jacobean done which uh, comes through, I think, throughout his career. Okay, so the foundation really of Dunn and possibly even the foundation of Elizabethan satire in toto. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, they're they're not just a a chronological beginning of Dunn's career, but they're the foundation of his whole way of writing. And they show him really working out how to write in a way that is simultaneously inside and outside an impassioned voice how you pile detail after detail in a disorderly fusion of disparate elements. And really, that's what Dunn does later in his career, in his lyrics. And they generate that Dunn sense of stuffing all kinds of stuff in so that you almost lose touch of where you are. And that does make them quite difficult. And part of our job today is to make them a bit less difficult by explaining uh, where all the stuff comes from and how he fits it all together. Yeah, I mean, I think we'll we'll look into the poems in detail and we'll describe their setting shortly. But why don't we begin by by relishing two moments, typical moments, where the poems seem to be trying to do that thing of crushing all of reality into a single sentence. And one mechanism they use is the uh, Collins written the profoundly unruly parenthesis or the insubordinate subordinate clause. Why don't you tell us about that? Yeah, uh, I think it's partly why they're so hard to read, actually. And you have to subordinate the subordinate clauses as you read them. And it helps to read them aloud because there's all this stuff bubbling up 
uh, in the middle of a sentence that you need to squeeze out in order to get the sense. Um, so, and you can hear this happening in Satire 1, where Dunn is addressing a friend or a part of himself or something. We, we'll talk about what it is later on. Uh, and this um, frivolous person wants to take him out of his study onto the streets of London. And Dunn writes this. Why shouldst thou that dost not only approve, but in rank itchy lust, desire and love the nakedness and bareness to enjoy of thy plump, muddy whore or prostitute boy, hate virtue, though she be naked and bare? Now, the main clause there, very simple, it's just an injunction to love virtue. And you cut out the parenthesis and it reads, why should you hate virtue even if she's naked and bare? But the parenthesis is actually where the rudeness comes in. It's just a matter of slipping vile insinuations in on the side that you like whores and boys. There's another good one of a vicious parenthesis in satire too, which is a poem that starts off attacking other poets and then moves in to attack the lawyer poet Coscus. Yeah, and part of the brilliance of that one is the stealthy way it moves from attacking poets to attacking lawyers who are its real target. And so this passage comes just as he, he moves from talking about uh, papists and poets who punish themselves and moves on to his real target, who is the, the lawyer poet Coscus. But these punish themselves. The insolence of Coscus only breeds my great offence, whom time, which rots all and makes botches pox and plodding on must make a calf an ox, has made a lawyer, which was, alas, of late, but a scarce poet. Again, you cut out the parenthesis and all it says is that Coscus, the former poet, has become a lawyer. Very simple. But if you add in the parenthesis, it becomes a whole mass of insinuation, you know, a calf. Well, that's an idiot, isn't it? And oxes, they're not very bright animals. And a botch is just a little spot on your face, which time turns into a full-on venereal infection, something the Elizabethans were very concerned about. It doesn't say directly that this guy Coscus is thick and syphilitic but you know by the end of it you're pretty sure that you know he was even if it's only insinuated through a parenthesis yeah and as we were, as we mentioned last time that um saying but not quite saying thing is germane to satire isn't it Absolutely. You keep it all indirect, impersonal, ideally abstract. You slip in the sides, you make sure it's not personalised. And and done satires really, I suppose, get away with more than they should get away with, because very often the really punchy stuff is hidden away in, in those unruly parentheses or in a, a long list of examples, uh, hidden away like needles in a haystack and needles, you know, sharp, barbed comments. And this is something that Juvenal also does. Um, you know, he throws in similes that look innocently decorative, but actually they are part of the barb. Um, and sometimes you're unsure what is a digression and what's the real target. And that does make them hard to read. But, you know, it is part of the energy of these poems. So among lawyers, he says at one point in Satire 2, lying is as much par for the course as bastardy is in king's lineages or simony and sodomy in churchmen's lives. You know, you get these extra sideways jabs that open the satyr up in, in all directions. And that's very much how he's working in these early works. That is akin to what Samuel Johnson once said about Dunn, a very perceptive comment that Dunn yokes heterogeneous ideas together by violence. Yeah, and here the violence is directed outwards often. Mm. You know, he's pulling stuff together in order to create this in insubordinate uh, style of writing full of cheeky similes, which pull together a whole load of matter but but throw them back in the face of the addressee. They, they sort of spread... Uh, filth vigorously out of the back of Dunn's hand while he's preaching virtue out of the front of it. OK, so before we look in more detail at the satires, let's talk about other satires written in the 1590s. So what was going on around Dunn? Was he unusual in the way he wrote? And why should we care about fan de siècle, Elizabethan satire, generally? Well, it I think it's the real powerhouse of late Elizabethan literature, actually. It, it's the most new genre uh, in the writing of that period. And it's also a genre that is powerfully mixed. So we mentioned in our last podcast how 
the word satire can be derived from two sources in this period. Uh, and there's a, there's a lovely passage actually in an English translation of a French Menippean satire, which is mixed prose and verse from 1595. And the author says that satires contain evil speech. Yes, they do. But also, Varro says that in ancient times, men called by this name a certain sort of pie or pudding into which men put diverse kinds of herbs and of meats. But I suppose that the word cometh from the Grecians, who at their public and solemn feasts did bring in upon the stages of stages or scaffolds certain persons disguised like unto satyrs, whom the people supposed to be half gods, full of laziness and wantonness in the woods. Okay, so evil speech, puddings, and wanton and savage satyrs, Elizabethan satire. Absolutely, and you get all of that and more in the printed verse satires, which appeared just after Dunn's in the late 1590s, but they emerged from very much the same milieu as Dunn's poems. Okay, and, and I we will probably come in later podcast to the question uh, why satire is so often a fan de siècle phenomenon. Oscar Wilde, yeah. Oscar Wilde, a great example. Um, why was it popular in the late 1590s, do you think? Well, people think of the 1590s as, as, as being great. You know, the Spanish Armada just dispatched England, glorifying in its queasy-making imperial expansion phase. Actually, they weren't. You know, there was huge inflation. There were food shortages and there were epidemics, particularly the plague, which um, really was able to carry off a significant percentage of the London population in a single week. Um, Elizabeth I, you know, she's there. Everybody says they love her, but she's wrinkly and ageing and she doesn't have any children, so no one knows who will succeed her. And London, you know, is itself a kind of monster of growth in this period, overflowing with a very young population, mostly of young men who can't find jobs. And there are flatterers and there are time servers who are the only people who do seem to get jobs. And there's the plague lurking in the background, ready to, ready to carry you off or your friends or your parents or whatever. And I think late Elizabethan men wanted to strike a pose of hostility to their times whilst showing that they knew all about it. And satire really is a brilliant way of doing that. It's a way of being embedded in a moment and also standing apart from it, mocking it. And young people do very often want to do that. And the young men who wrote satire in the Elizabethan period do it in spades. Thanks for listening to this extract from On Satire, a close reading series from the London Review of Books. To listen to the full episode and all our other close reading series, sign up to our close reading subscription at lrb.me forward slash close readings or click on the link in the description.